Well, good morning again and welcome. Through the Easter season, we have been in a study of eternal life. We've been looking at Jesus' beautiful prayer in John chapter 17. But I don't want us to move away too quickly from the empty tomb. There's too much to see there. There's too much to learn there. So for this week and next week, we're going to continue thinking about the resurrection and the practical implications for how we should live in light of that. And then the following week, Pastor Glenn will be back, and we're going to continue then our study of the book of Daniel. So this morning, we're going to look at Matthew's account of the resurrection from Matthew chapter 28. So if you have a Bible, feel free to turn there with me, or you can follow along on the screens behind me. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, <clears throat> for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Father in heaven, we would ask this morning, as we think together about this scripture and this story, we would ask, O oh Lord, that you'd show us Christ, the risen Savior, in a fresh way, we pray, O oh Lord, that we would not just see him afresh, but we would hear the commands he gives us from that empty tomb. And those commands would find their way down into our hearts and then out <clears throat> into our lives in the way we live. And we ask it all in the strong name of Jesus himself. Amen. This is my grandmother, who I refer to as Granny. This woman was very, very precious to me. This is my dad's mom. You've heard me speak about my grandfather, Amen. This was his wife. This woman was so dear to me, so precious to me. When she passed away a number of years ago, most of our family was at her bedside. Now, we knew she was dying. We could see the visual signs on the monitors in that hospital room in Dyersburg, Tennessee. We could see them slowing down. And though most of us were Christians, and my dad happened to be a pastor as well, at that moment in time, we were all so overwhelmed with fear and with sadness, we, we were paralyzed. Now, thankfully, another minister who's a friend of my father's was on his way up to the hospital to see us. He came into the room. He saw immediately what was going on. And he said to us, let's bow our heads right now and let's pray together. And we did, and my grandmother died as we were lifting her up before the Lord. You see, there are times in our lives when we're struggling, when we're hurting, when we have trauma, when we're afraid, we get paralyzed. And we need somebody to tell us what to do. That's exactly what the women who first went to Jesus' tomb on that Sunday morning after after he was buried, that's what they needed. They needed to be told what to do. You see, they and the disciples, they were devastated. Jesus, the Messiah, had been crucified and buried. All their faith and trust had been put in that tomb. Their world had come undone. Their hearts were broken. You see, people 
don't think or act rationally in times like that. And everything about the women going to that tomb that morning was irrational, all of it. And yet they went. And when they got there, this extraordinary event happened. This angel from heaven descended. The earth began to shake. This massive stone was rolled away from the mouth of that tomb. The angel set upon it. And the guards, these hardened warriors, they were cowering in fear. I mean, how could anybody think clearly in a situation like that? But the Lord, the Lord knew their troubled minds and their spirits, and He gave them a, and He gave us commands from the empty tomb to get us thinking straight about what does it mean to us that Christ has risen. You see, because Christ is alive, He still speaks. And this morning for a little bit, what I want to do is listen to His commands from the empty tomb Now, it's important to say, when an angel of the Lord speaks, he only speaks the words of the Lord. The angel never speaks his own words. So these are words, these are commands from the Lord himself. And the first one is to do not be afraid. Now, you think about it. These women had just witnessed this supernatural Christian, this supernatural creature descending from the heavens, the ground shaking under their feet, the tomb opening up. I mean, their only response would have been the same as those soldiers, it would have been terror. And you see, that's what always happens when the natural comes in contact with the supernatural. But so often in the Scriptures, when God reveals Himself in a way like that, He tells His people, don't be afraid. Now why does He do that? He does it because He knows we are prone to be afraid of the wrong things. When I was a young man, before um, I became a Christian, I should have been afraid of everything, but I was not afraid of anything. I'd do anything, and I would try anything. Now that I've gotten to be an older man, I've become a Christian, I shouldn't be afraid of anything, but I'm afraid of everything. Can I get an amen? amen? You see, I'm afraid of what people think about. I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid of the future. I'm afraid of the past. I'm afraid about my health. I'm afraid about my finances. And these things can easily paralyze me. And you know what I'm talking about because they paralyze you as well. But you know what I've learned the hard way? The thing that you fear will determine what you worship. Whatever you fear, that's what you worship. For instance, if you fear being poor, you'll worship financial security. You'll worry about not having enough. You'll stress over unexpected costs and working and earning will become your God. And to that and all these other things that we fear, the Lord says, don't be afraid of anything except me. Now we're not talking about, when we talk about the fear of the Lord, we're not talking about His punishment or His wrath falling upon us because if you're in Christ that's not going to happen we're talking about a respectful fear that drowns out all the other worldly fears this is a fear that wants to honor the Lord that wants to praise him that wants to worship him that wants to serve him that wants to trust him with everything we do now it's easy to think that the opposite of fear is courage, but it's not. The opposite of fear is love. That's why Jesus said, perfect love casts away fear. Now, how does that work? Well, let me tell you. In my own life, Christ's extraordinary love for me, shown on that cross at Calvary and by way of that empty tomb, says He already thinks highly of me, that I'm a success in His eyes. That my future is in His good hands and my past is nailed to the cross. That I'm guaranteed that any sickness and suffering and even death will lead to new life. That I have an eternal inheritance that money can't buy. And because Christ is the victor, evil and the devil himself has no power over me. You know what I think practically fearing the Lord looks like? I think it's every day rejoicing 
giving thanks, acknowledging who God is, and laying hold of the gospel truths that Jesus loves me with an everlasting love. So the first command of the angel is a command, don't be afraid. And this command is given gentle, I believe. I believe it's like a mom or a dad that's comforting one of their children who's woken up in the middle of the night with a bad dream. Don't be afraid. See, the empty tomb says clearly to everyone who has embraced the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ by faith, we don't have a single thing to fear except the Lord. And just so we don't miss it, the Lord himself repeats these words, words of assurance, do not be afraid. But I want you to notice something. The angel only spoke to the women. He only spoke to the women, do not be afraid. Not to the guards who were terrified. And here's the point. Those who don't know Christ have every reason to be afraid. Because apart from him, one day, you, like all of us, will stand before the Lord. And rather than hear the words, don't be afraid, we'll hear the words, depart from me. I don't know you. Human being could not hear any worse words. But because Christ died, because he's risen from the grave, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. So the first command is don't be afraid. The second one is to come. Now, this is clearly a command, but more than that, it's an invitation. Think about it. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he told people to come. To his disciples, he said, come and follow me. To the masses, he said, if any one of you is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. To the kids, he said, let the little children come and don't hinder them. And to people who were hurting and broken, traumatized, exhausted, he said, come to me, all you who are weary, overburdened, and I will give you rest. And you know what? Today, he invites you to come as well. Now, it's important to understand, we have to un get this, that none of us would come to the Lord unless he first comes to us. It's the way it works. But in his grace, his Holy Spirit comes to us and he moves in our hearts. He gives us ears to hear and eyes to see him and he gives us faith to cry out to him. So if you're here this morning, you're a Christian, I want you to see and I want you to remember as you look at that empty tomb that the Lord's invitation to come is given to you. To come with your weary and heavy hearts and find rest. To come with your sorrows and find joy. To come with your grief and find comfort. To come with your brokenness and find healing. To come with your hopelessness and find hope. To come with your shame and find cleansing. To come with your sin and find forgiveness. But you know what? Jesus also invites us to come and join him in his work, responding to the needs of the world around us. You may be here this morning or worshiping with us online, and, and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I understand that well. I was that way for many, many years myself. But I want you to see this as a personal invitation for you to come. To come this morning. And cry out to Christ. Confess your sins. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to come into your heart. Come and proclaim Him as your personal Lord and Savior. And when you do that, the words you always hear, the words from our Lord and Savior, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Come. The next command is to see. There was something that the women had to see with their own eyes before they could lay hold of it by faith. Now, why did the crowds follow Jesus the way they did? Why did he have such a profound effect on them? Why would people give up everything, including their life, to follow Christ? 
Was it because he was a skilled leader or a great teacher or a good man? He was all of those things. That's not the reason. They followed him because they saw with their eyes the power and the authority of God over sickness, over the demonic, over death. But even more, they saw the empty tomb. Seeing really does change everything. I think the most powerful testimonies I've ever heard <clears throat> are those who have actually seen with their eyes the power of the risen Lord in their lives. I mean, over the years, I have worked with a lot of men in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction. And I have seen God do miraculous things in their lives many, many times. In one meeting, a man shared his testimony about Christ miraculously healing him of alcoholism. Another fellow came up to him and he said, Surely you don't believe all that silly stuff about Jesus' miracles in the Bible. And the man said this, I don't know about any of that. But in my house I've seen the miracle of God turning whiskey into furniture. My own testimony is the power of the risen Lord to change a drug abuser into a pastor. I've seen it with my eyes, and you've seen it. There are only two responses to the empty tomb. You receive Christ or, re or you reject him. That's it. Only one of those will lead to spiritual sight. The other will lead to abject spiritual blindness. Don't be afraid. Come, see. The next command is to go quickly. What value would it have been if the women had stayed at the tomb, even if they had just reflected on the resurrection and even celebrated it by themselves? What value would it have been? None. They didn't, though. They went away, and they went away quickly. In fact, the Bible tells us they ran away with fear and joy. Why is that? Because the empty tomb always comes with a sense of urgency. And the reason it does is because there's not a promise. Not one human being has the promise of even one more hour on this earth, one more day. See, the Lord wants us to share in his sense of urgency, and he commands all who name the name of Jesus to share in that with him. I can't tell you how many times I've gone and visited someone in the hospital or gone to a nursing home or to an assisted living place. And when I, la I left, that was the last time I ever saw that person alive. The empty tomb comes with a sense of urgency. So, who has God put on your heart today? A friend, a co-worker, classmate, a neighbor, somebody in your family? Two words for us the Lord gives us. Go quickly. Go quickly. And tell. That's the next command we see here. People have to hear the good news of Christ before it can make any difference in their lives. And they will only hear it if someone tells them the story. That's why Paul would say, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. Now I want you to think about something. Think about the women at the tomb that morning. Surely they were tempted to not go and tell anybody anything. Remember, in Jesus' day, women's testimony was considered poor. They weren't allowed to testify in a court of law. They were at the bottom end of society. Nobody would have believed them. And so... Why let people think you're crazy? Just keep your mouth shut and save the embarrassment. But they couldn't. Why? Because you and I both know it is absolutely impossible for you to keep really, really good news to yourself. Nobody can do that. 
Think about the times in your life when you had some really, really good news. You said, oh, I'm just not going to tell anybody. You couldn't do that. To tell what they had seen and heard was and still is the primary means that God uses to make his son known in this world. And that's exactly what the early church began to do. They began to tell the story of Jesus Christ, this one who was born of a virgin in a manger, the one who lived a sinless life, who died a sacrificial death on that cross to pay the price for sin, the one who was buried, but on the third day he rose from the grave. And he ascended into heaven where he sits right now at the side of the Father. He's interceding. He's praying for you and for me. And the church grew at an extraordinary rate because God's people told other people. Now, what is it that keeps us from doing that? I think for most of us, everything else in our lives is way too high, is a much higher priority. Sharing the gospels way down there somewhere between going to the dentist, you know, down in that area, to the gym maybe. An old missionary one time said, he said, there are but three things that truly matter. God, God's word, and the souls of men. Three things that truly matter. Are those three things the things that matter to us? I think another reason is, is we're like the women at the tomb. We're afraid. We're afraid of what people say, what they'll do when we speak to them about Jesus. And to to us, the Lord says, don't be afraid. Sharing the gospel is not hard. Not rocket science. Simply telling people about who Jesus is and what he did and how he has affected your life. And you know what? To help us in that, we got an evangelism training seminar coming up just for you. (laughs) Praise the Lord, eh? May 6th, May 13th. We got our friend Chris Peeler is going to be here. Chris is a lovely brother in the Lord. He teaches simple but effective ways to share the good news. And just to make it easy on you, we have a sign-up sheet right out there in the narthex. And so, I'm going to be looking for a long line out there at that table when this service is over. And I'm going to use these same words to encourage you. Don't be afraid. Come and see and go quickly and sign up so that you can tell somebody about Jesus. Think about this. How would you and I have ever known about the gospel unless somebody had told us the good news. And how would they have ever known unless the church throughout the ages has told others? And how will our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren know unless we tell them? And that's why Paul would say, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. The Lord sees very little that's more beautiful than one of his people who's willing to tell somebody else. Don't be afraid. Come, see, go quickly, tell. And here's the last command. Rejoice and be glad. Now, no longer is the angel of the Lord speaking for Christ. He begins to speak for himself. And look what he says. He says, greetings. Literally, this means to rejoice and be glad. Matthew records Christ's first words out of the tomb were greetings. Rejoice and be glad. The women needed to hear that and so do we. You can imagine their mental state having dealing with all of this, their minds racing, trying to make sense of it all. The one thing they might have forgotten to do was to rejoice because Christ was alive. Their hopes, their dreams was standing in the flesh in front of them. See, the resurrection proved without question that sin and death had no power over the Lord, and that alone is reason to rejoice. One of my favorite books of all time, 
It's Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. I love this book. It's one, one chapter in the book where Christian, the main character, he's making his way to the celestial city and he comes along this narrow path and on this pathway this, there's a lion, two lions, one on either side, snarling, growling, blocking the path. He's frozen in fear. He's terrified. Can't move. There's a man up the head. He says, brother, come forward. Don't worry about those lines. They're restrained. Christian couldn't move. He says again, brother, come forward. Don't worry about the lions. They're restrained. So Christian begins to inch. He moves, his, moves forward. And as soon as he moves forward, those two lions rush out at him. But they're snapped back because they're massive chains around their neck. And I love what Bunyan said. He says, the lions are shackled. And Christian walks through with great joy. The lions represent the power of sin and death, and they are shackled because of the empty tomb. Can there be any greater reason to rejoice? What is it that keeps us from rejoicing? Well, you know it's our circumstances. Sickness, loss, broken relationships, fear, death. These things all conspire to rob us of our joy. But, beloved, regardless of circumstance, if you're in Christ, we have every reason to rejoice because the same grave which could not hold our Savior, neither will it hold any who put their faith and their trust in Him. You see, that's the eternal perspective of the empty tomb that gives us faith to persevere in a very messed up world and through really, really hard, hard circumstances that we all face. When Granny died and that minister prayed with us, we went from being paralyzed in fear and grief to rejoicing because we knew she had gone home to be with the Lord. How is it that one can stand over the lifeless body of someone who is precious to them and rejoice? Only because of the empty tomb. Because Christ is alive, He still speaks. So here's our assignment. It's real simple and clear. Don't be afraid. Come, see, go quickly, tell. Rejoice and be glad. The tomb is empty, but it still speaks very, very loudly. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, how we praise your name. We thank you for your word. We praise you and thank you that the tomb could not hold our Savior and neither will it hold any of his people. Let love stimulate our courage. Give us the strength to come and see, to go quickly and tell, and above all, to rejoice and be glad because Christ is risen. He is not here. Lord, we want you to make a difference in our hearts and in our lives. We ask you by your spirit to come and do your good work. And we will praise you. We will thank you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus himself. Amen. Please stand.